The president of Curtis once shared a tone secret with me that changed my life. And today, I'm gonna to change yours. Don't believe me? Well, today I'm gonna to teach a violinist this technique for the first time, and you'll be able to hear the transformation in her sound. Neglect this secret, and you may struggle for years trying to figure out how the pros do it. Speaking of pros, this is Hilary Hahn. She is getting an incredible sound. Notice how little bow she's using? How on earth is she getting that much sound using that little bow? If you've been watching the tone series, you may just think that she's found the perfect balance between weight, bow speed, and contact point. While that's definitely true, there's another part of the equation that's not so easy to spot. So in order to show you this technique, we need an object lesson. So like I said, Kate has never learned this technique before. This is how I teach it to my students. So I'm gonna push you back and forth in two different ways. This is the first way. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm applying enough force downward to create enough friction that I can pull her back and forth. This is typically the way that we think about playing on the violin. I'm gonna exert enough arm weight downward that when I pull side to side, there's enough friction so that I can grip the string and not skate over the top of it. However, there is another way to do this. Way number two, I had to apply almost zero pressure to the shoulder, but by changing the angle of the hand in order to push her back and forth, I was able to get this extra bit of resistance. So her shoulder is the string and my hand was the bow. So if I'm doing an up bow, I can tilt the bow this way and push through the string like this. Or if I'm doing a down bow, I can tilt the bow this way and pull through the string like this. Now one important thing to understand here is that when I change the angle of my hand, I'm still trying to push Kate straight back. I'm not trying to push along this new angle that I've created with my hand. And when I tilt my hand this way, I'm trying to pull her straight back. And it's the difference in angle between the angle of my hand and the angle that I'm actually trying to pull her at that creates the extra resistance. Let's try this on the violin and we'll go to our old friend Abos to see how this works. So for this, we're gonna be using the down of down stage. When you're doing the down bow, I want you to touch the A and the D string. On the up bow, you'll hit the A and the E, and on the down, you'll hit the A and the D. It'll look like this. Give it a go. Now just barely don't hit the D string and barely don't hit the E string. That's right, and little nicks are totally fine as you're starting to get used to the motion. Yeah, that's starting to work. Ready? Huh? Nice. Okay, so this is already the motion that we're looking for. Now, the hard thing to sort of visualize is the fact that when you change the angle of the bow, you're trying to still pull the string along that original angle. So this is the original angle, and when you tilt the bow, you're still trying to pull along that original angle. And it's the difference in those two angles that creates the extra resistance that makes it possible for us to use less arm weight and to get more sound. So on this next one, Kate, keep doing the same sort of angle change that you've been doing, but then I'm gonna show with my hand the angle that I want you to actually feel like you're pulling through the string at. One of the tricky things about this is the way that I'm gonna show it is actually the opposite of the direction that the bow is actually gonna go. Aim for a little bit more bow speed. That's it! Yes, we're getting there, ready. And... Yes, do you hear how the body of the instrument, the 
ring is getting bigger now. <laughs> You're starting to feel a little bit more resistance, I think, in the string. I think you're also using less pressure. <laughs> Excellent. Now just compete with me for sound. Kate's sound in the first example is already pretty good. She's pulling a fairly pure sound with a good balance of weight, speed, and contact point. However, the sound is slightly pressed. You can hear breaks in the sound, and the arm weight is finding its limit here. The most notable difference that we hear when we use figure eight motion is that the rough edges go away. The sound is less pressed overall, and she's still getting just as big of a sound, but it now has a sense of effortlessness. The tone is beautifully open, and there's a spinning quality to it. So now that you've seen the difference that figure eight motion can make, it's time to share with you a protocol for how to develop it. You just saw the beginning of the process. We use down, up, down in our A bows, and we hit strings A and D on the down bows, and A and E on the up bow. The next step is maintaining that bow angle change and barely not hitting the D string and barely not hitting the E string. If you slightly nick the D or the E string, no big deal. We're just trying to ingrain the motion into your body. After ingraining it here, I'd like to move on to the next stage of ABOs doing it with extra bow changes. If you don't already know the progression for ABOs, I recommend checking out this video here, which will give you the basic framework. Notice that when I'm doing the extra bow changes, I'm still employing the same angle change. This again helps to ingrain the idea deeper, and it also helps with our bow changes to smooth them out because we're not using as much pressure. After you've gotten comfortable with the figure eight motion on A bows, it's time to apply them into your scales. Slow bow scales is one of the places where figure eight motion really stands out. Typically when we're trying to pull out a big sound with not a lot of bow, there's a breaking point that we hit. Now figure eight motion can really push the limits for this because remember, using it, we can use less pressure and still get the resistance on the string to not skate over the top. So instead of merely adding more pressure, what I can do is I can simply use the difference in angle. So I tilt the bow this way, pull through the string this way, and that extra resistance is gonna make it so that I can get more pull without increasing my pressure. Remember when I talked at the beginning about how Hilary Hahn gets this huge soloistic sound without using too much bow? I'm convinced that this is how the pros do it. Even if they're not aware of the technique, which I believe most of them are, I still think that they employ something similar to this figure eight motion in order to get the big sound without using too much bow. After doing this for a while, you can get into this sweet spot where it almost feels effortless. If you've ever surfed behind a boat before, it almost feels like that to me, where you find this sweet spot where you're, you're pushing into the wave 
and there's this resistance that you're meeting and you're also moving forward into it and it propels you forward. It's the same with this. There's this point where you feel this extra bit of resistance from the string and it's almost like you're not doing any work but the sound is just coming out. shock you that the sound continues not to break and that you can continue to push your limits. So we go back to the old scale protocol. Again, if you haven't watched my scale video already, you can check it out here and it'll give you the progression. Turning the metronome to 60 beats per minute, we'll start with 4 beats per bow. Focused on trying to ingrain that angle change into your body. And as always, we're really trying to test the limits of what our fiddle can give, which of course now should be more than ever before. Next, we go on to three beats per bow. Continuing to push your limits. We go through the whole progression, continuing to think about the figure eight motion. Now it can be challenging at first to remember what direction the angle change should be going, particularly since we're adding in string crossings when we go to scales. This rule of thumb will help you to stay organized. On the down bows, move towards the lower strings, and on the up bows, move towards the upper strings. So when you switch to that new string, to the D string, just remember, okay, it's a down bow, I want to be close to the G string. It's an up bow, I want to be close to the A string. I also find it helpful once I get to the slightly faster speeds of two beats per bow and one beat per bow to add in the extra bow changes. Again, I kind of can't wait for you to try this just because it makes your slow bow scales so much easier and you can get such a big sound. And honestly, I feel that once you figure this out in your scales, all of a sudden your maximum sound in your concerti goes way up and your bow control as well. I have a student right now who's preparing to do her college auditions in the next few weeks. And I was noticing that her concerto sound was starting to diminish and I asked her if she was continuing to be diligent with these slow bow scales. She said no. A week ago I refreshed the assignment to make sure these were our priority before the auditions. And when she performed it for others in the studio yesterday, without even knowing the assignment that I had given her, the other students commented on the marked difference in the projection of her sound. So I guarantee you, if you work on this figure eight motion, get it ingrained in you, you will be sounding better than ever. After getting this motion ingrained in your scales, it's time to apply it to your pieces. And I also wanna share just a little bit of nuance about when you want to apply it. I would consider this figure eight motion just another variable in how you adjust your sound. I would say that I use figure eight motion almost all of the time, but sometimes not. It's very good at creating a seamless, open, spinning quality to your sound. And most of the time that's what you want, but sometimes you want a sound that feels a little bit grittier and almost has a little bit more resistance in it. Take for example a schmaltzy moment in Tchaikovsky. That little bit of extra surface noise. almost increases the intensity for me. However, if you're playing something like Franck Fourth Movement and you want just this open, resonant, easy sound that's still projecting, then figure eight motion's the way to go. Hear the openness in that sound. Also, the way I was just practicing, I would highly recommend when you're first trying to ingrain figure eight motion into your performance pieces. I call this find your sound kind of practice, where you're willing to stop on any note that doesn't have the exact quality of sound that you're after, and then just find it. Play with your variables. Play with your vibrato until you find the sweet spot. And if you have a transition that doesn't go how you want to, just linger on it.
This will also give your brain space to internalize the angle changes that should be made with the bow. It's also super useful for a later moment in the Frank Sonata where we're trying to get a huge sound, but we're high in the string where the string responds more to bow speed rather than pressure. So in order to not crush the sound, we use figure eight motion to still make it big. I hope you're as excited about this concept as I was when I first learned it. I get excited every time a student gets ready to learn this concept, and I hope you have a fantastic time internalizing this and noticing the incredible new sounds that you can create. Learning the secrets of tone production is a critical aspect to mastering the violin, and it's usually the first thing that I teach when students come into my studio. However, no matter how good your tone is, if you don't have your left hand worked out, you're still not gonna sound like the violinist you wanna be. This video should get you on track for mastering your left hand.